Well, I, I think energy is going to go higher, without doubt. We've seen the lows. They're pretty much established, and I think we're going to end up with surges. And that goes back to this idea about central banks thinking inflation's under control. And you know, they didn't even see it coming, didn't understand really what it was. I love, you know, Andrew Bailey saying, we can't predict a war. And I wrote to him and said, well, I could. So wouldn't you like some advice? And there was silence. Hello and welcome to this video for Fortune and Freedom. I'm joined today by global forecaster David Murren, who's had a rather good run of late when it comes to his forecasts about the Ukraine war and the energy crisis. At the beginning of the month, he wrote that we should brace for the next phase of Putin's energy war. And sure enough, the headline a week later was Russia to cut oil output in response to Western nations price cap. David, before we get to your predictions, uh, both the ones that have been correct recently and also what you think happens next. I want to explain, well, I want to hear from you, first of all, why you're, you're doing this, why you're a global forecaster, who you are. And then I want to ask you the most difficult question in global forecasting. <laughs> OK, great. So uh, the reason I mean, I come from the world of finance, ran my own hedge fund for you know 25 years and I stopped managing money in about 2013 because I saw far too much money printing going on that I didn't really want to be a part of. I did promise to come back when I thought that was over. And in 19, I could see that it was well and truly, you know, going to be near the end phase. And so I was about to sort of set up my own hedge fund. And I suddenly thought, it doesn't really help how much money we make, because I think we're in such a disastrous global scenario for the Western economies. And the predication of my book, Breaking the Code of History, which really started its work in 02, that was published seven years later, predicted everything that's happened over the past two decades in terms of the decline of America, how America would decline, the rise of China, this rushing um, surge of commodity prices into 2022, which would lead to World War Three, And... Um, my concern was I have children. We all have children. And actually, we have responsibility for the legacy we leave them. And there we were sleepwalking into this brick wall. So I wanted Global Forecaster to do something you couldn't do when you manage money. Because when you manage money, your investors demand silence. They don't like you to talk to the public. So I needed a, a platform where I could share the knowledge that you could only really assimilate if you'd had financial background in this collective behavior of systems and people and create a platform to do that. And Global Forecaster is exactly that platform and it has various layers from its geopolitical layers and predictions to its financial layers to basically being a hedge fund inside that then people access and they pay to access the IP rather than we manage the money. And the whole idea behind it was to create a cascade of awareness that would m motivate and create a dynamism inside our society for change. And I have to say that, relatively speaking, even as the signals come thick and fast, the, the collective denial that we live through in the Western world and in Britain right now is the most alarming thing I could ever describe. You know, 20 years ago, I would not have imagined that through the sort of process of printing money, this sort of linearization of beta trend following, that means most of the people in finance have become quite linear in the way they think. The people at the tops of organisations have become linear. And indeed in Britain, Brexit was about a lateralisation, a process of a more adaptive style of thinking to a world that was changing really rapidly. And we failed to do all of those things on a multiple layer level. There have been some successes in the UK, but not many. And so that's the basis of Global Forecaster. And, and scarily, in my wildest dreams, you know, you, you're always, you always have to be quite humble in prediction because when you think you're going to get one right, it'll slap you like a wet fish. But actually, our calls have been frighteningly prescient, whether it was the arrival of the pandemic, which I wrote about in Breaking the Code of History, a byproduct of hegemonic challenge from a Chinese weapons laboratory, or whether it's basically this run-in, which is now with Russia, predicting the Ukrainian war six months in advance. And um, I was surprised initially that the Ukrainians survived. After about five days, I had to do a rapid revaluation of what we thought we were looking at and what we were looking at were two very different things. And since then, I've been something like 32 marinations on the Ukrainian war and pretty much predicting how it's been unfolding before most people in the public domain have understood that. I've got the lights flickering above me. It'd be ironic if there was a blackout in a podcast about an energy crisis, but I'm on battery too. So as long as the internet stays up, we should be all right. Um, there's a bit of irony here. If you succeed and you raise awareness through your predictions, uh, then they won't come true anymore because people will be able to avert them. Isn't that true? 
That's exactly right. And I would prefer that outcome than to actually be correct in some of my predictions. <laughs> the whole purpose I think that's of the point, really, isn't it? That's the point you're trying to make of uh, not, not trading this through a hedge fund for your, yourself and your clients. You're actually trying to achieve something. That's exactly right. And in and, and a broader sense of it's not just someone on the soapbox saying, watch out. I've created a, a whole load of constructs called my it's kind of collective human theory of behavior from why we very exist, how we create social structures, how those social structures create anti-entropy, which pushes back the universe of the, the, the entropy of the universe, and how we actually build social systems like empires because they create maximum coherence to push that further back. But then also I, I described this idea where we use war as part of our evolutionary process to remove sequestered old empires with more dynamic, dynamic empires that are more lateral in their mindset. So their peak then is higher than the previous peak. And that's been the story of human development. And it's a shocking thing that we all abhor war, yet we're here because war does this process. And until we are more aware of what we're actually doing, that war is intrinsic to our evolutionary cycle, we are not going to be able to address it. And the trouble is we reached a point where our weapon systems are so destructive that that protocol of evolution is now at an end. And we face this decision ahead of us is how do we get through what is World War Three unfolding without removing the human race in what was an unconscious evolutionary process. And that's the biggest paradigm we live in right now. It seems a bit strange to say this, but I want to stick with the energy crisis because it's a bit more bite sized. And I think World War Three is just I think people who've read some of your work and understand how you do it are going to be interested in that. But I, I want to focus on the energy crisis because your prediction has, has proven so accurate uh, within just this month. But before we get to that, like I said, the most difficult question in global forecasting, at least when it comes to being the interviewer, is where do we start the interview? Because it seems to me that all of this is a long line of dominoes that have, have been falling over. And so there's no obvious place to start because it always just depends on what happened before that and the context that came before that. So if you want to talk about Europe and, and the more global energy crisis, where should an interview about that start? Well, it starts probably in two of the largest degrees possible. A shift in power between the super Western Christian empire and the rise of the Asian empire. America being the last of the Western Christian empires within a bigger system. Britain being the anomaly in trying to be expansive and restart like a green shoot. But that's small fry at the moment. And although that being said, that green shoot saved Ukraine. So it's not to be underestimated that without that lateral approach from Britain in its own cycle, Ukraine would have gone under and we'd be facing the same issues on the Polish border or the Estonian border. So there's if people question, did Brexit work? Absolutely, because it changed the course of European history because of a lateral leadership that stepped into the breach when no other leadership would have done. So that's Already. a huge construct. And the next construct is that Japan was the first Asian empire. We know what happened to it. It became an ally after Reformation in 45. And China is the second. And it's 120 plus years into its rise into that challenge. And uh, essentially, those two systems of transference are you know interesting and most people would turn around and say well oh, you know been going for a long time and why now and it's going to carry on and why interfere with my life well there's another system which is a process which is the Kondratiev cycle which is much more than just an inflationary cycle in my opinion i think it's like the drumbeat for human anti-entropy that rejiggles the deck to remove old systems and and promote new and into its peak there's always conflict of some kind and the previous conflicts are the peak of the Cold War in 75, the onset of World War One in 14, then the American Civil War, and then the Napoleonic Wars. They all fit that same area and where there was massive social change through conflict and old was replaced with new. Can you explain and just quickly the, the underlying idea of the Contradiv cycle? It's basically a 56-year cycle that peaks roughly halfway through that, so somewhere between 26 and 27 years we started um, essentially in 2000, the new cycle, roughly. But the trouble is, as you surge, so you have one surge of prices, which was the decade into 2010. You have a counterinflationary cycle, which we've had, which was made even more infl counterinflationary because of the twin processes of cheap energy from Russia and cheap manufacturing from China, which was the exportation of our manufacturing base. And then around 2020, you end up with this super surge and my thesis is that surge has not stopped. 
that essentially we are on the way to a much, much higher prices. And this particular surge is a surge when you see conflict. You've seen it in Russia because those prices of energy have given his war chest over the past decade have enough money to build weapons that he believed were better than the West, you know, like Status 6 poison submarines or, you know, Avogad's hypersonic glide weapons or the Satan missile, which goes and attacks America from the south rather than the north. Ideas of strategically he'd hold the balance. He thought he'd reform the army and we know he hasn't. But nonetheless, that money fed into his coffers. Russia is not an expansive system. It has negative demographics, negative national energy, and therefore it is his vision that drives the whole country. The country itself is unable to do that. And in fact, the army is a significant portion of the national population, and it actually shows the same low quality of national energy in the way it's engaged in this conflict. So, so that process has triggered adventurism on behalf of Putin because of the wealth of a commodity producing society. And interesting to go back, you think of the 70s, the 70s were the time when the USSR was absolutely rampant. The West didn't believe that we could stop you know, the, the, the communism and they thought that the wealth of, of the communist state, which produced some really great weapons, like the SA-2 guideline anti-aircraft missile, appeared in that time. We had nothing like it. So they were not only using, they were wealthier, they were using it to harness weapons. It didn't look like the moral construct of the West was working, mainly because we're in an inflationary paradigm and everyone questioned whether that worked. So we're in the same part of the cycle and Russia's resurgent at the same part of the cycle because it's a commodity producing state. Now, the problem is that as the prices start to go up, now you end up with self-feeding competitive dynamics. And China's moment essentially is here. It is either going to make its move within the next year to 18 months or it's never going to make its move because it has negative demographics. It set itself up a bit like the Nazis did in 1936 after the march into the Rhinelands with a four-year plan, which basically is a shit or bus plan. I've either militarized my society and expanded or I'm bankrupt. And that's pretty much where she is. He's got a couple of other key things that are working for him. He's got a hypersonic weapon system which destroys warships and carriers and they're almost unable to defend against it in saturation attacks that window is, can't be lost you only get one of those windows as a hegemonic challenger after that window goes then the hegemon closes the window and you don't go again so that's in the next year to year and a half there's no solution to hypersonic weapon defense on the horizon and they're only energy weapons that look like they can do it so everything that's happening right now is down to the development of one system a hegemonic weapon of challenge hypersonic weapons putin had them in the, his zircon missiles which basically aren't prevalent yet but three years ahead without a defense system they lay bare all of our surface fleet so these systems are coming about because we were asleep and we in the hubris of the West thought we were going to be dominant for 100 years. But the challengers found ways around that dominance. And we have sleepwalked into this. I've been warning ever since 2018, the hypersonic weapons were the weapon that would bring about change because they let the challenger believe they could act. And all of this is coming together at the same time into the peak of this Kondratiev cycle. So that's the horizon we're living at. We're living at a point where Putin has gone into Ukraine. He's miscalculated. He was, it wasn't a done deal that they were a bunch of, you know, incompetent military planners. And, you know, you look back and think they weren't a threat. They were closer than we give them credit for. If the intelligence agencies hadn't been controlling this, the way the column was formed that went into Ukraine and had actually gone and put the combat units at the front and the cooks at the back rather than vice versa, they would have had a very different outcome. But they were so preoccupied with disguising their intent that essentially they created a misformed column of, of, of invasion which couldn't really do the job when it met opposition. But that first advance could have been far more, you know, there were, there were lots, of, lots of elements of luck that kept it together. It wasn't incompetence. But now that the weight of NATO has finally decided two months ago, I think if you look at the stages of the war, it's important to understand again, why is Putin so desperate? So he used what he thought was his modified Russian army. They, you know, advanced on various axes. Those axes were countered. And this is the bit that isn't really discussed. NATO has been using its battlefield surveillance systems from the edges of the border where Russia can't shoot them down. So we have 100% transparency of the battlefield. As was revealed in the press recently, all the HIMARS missions were given targets by the West. So what part of this is the West not at war with Russia? 
Now we've created this sort of cloak and, and Putin knows if he goes to war with NATO, he'll lose outright, which is why he doesn't cross over it. But this grey zone that has allowed us to, you know, to fight really Russia directly, even though we say it's indirectly with Russian soldiers doing the dying, but weapons and direction coming from the West is a state of war. Now, I understand why our politicians wouldn't emphasise that. That makes sense. But I don't understand why recognising the state we are in doesn't mean that we're not spending 5% on defence of GDP and another 5% in capital sums. It, and, and so there's nothing... We have politicians in total denial. And I, I listened to the process of the defence secretary talking about, you know, we're going to have major, major increases and it's something like 11 to £8 billion pounds over two years. And you scratch your head and think, that isn't a major increase. Major increase would be we're spending £100 billion pounds this year and £100 billion pounds every year, whatever it takes, because the survival of our state is at stake. And so we've got stuck in incrementalism. And of course, incrementally, when you've been lowering defence budgets for 20 years, if you sort of say you've made an advance, you look like you're a bold mover. You're not. I think Wallace has done a great job of supporting Ukraine. He's a stalwart. And, and if I wanted a politician to tell Putin if he did one thing, we would do something else, I'd put him on the TV. But in terms of the vision and the, and the magnitude of the problem we face and the lack of combat power in our forces, it's terrifying right now. And so, you know, the competency requires much bigger, like, pressure points from the public to a prime minister who seems to have his head in the sand completely about the status we're in, to a treasury that seems to hijack the whole nation state's agenda from tax rises to defence spending. We have to wake up, and that's because we didn't lateralise in Brexit. We ended up with a Brexit that people voted for, a lateral leader, the change agent who was rather not balanced, I would say, with chips all over his shoulders, was fired and were not replaced. And the civil service just carried on doing what they're doing. And then there was a, a, a coup of a type where the Conservative Party replaced any form of lateralism with a technocrat. So now we're like super linear and from every single... And yet the world around us is adapting. The EU that people thought they wanted to stay used to be a large portion of the world's GDP, and now it's a teeny fraction. You know, you need to wake up and reevaluate. That was always going to happen. But, but change is happening around us, and the only thing that we can do is adapt by understanding the terrain we're in. So the energy freeze that we're talking about, the energy constriction, comes after almost a year of the suppression of energy prices. And the Americans stepped up to the plate enormously. They've been selling their strategic reserve. They've been pumping what they can. But the investment into oil fields basically hasn't been enough to really create a long-term supply chain from the Western world into you know, its various uses. And so we're coming to the end of that artificial suppression. And Putin himself is at the point where he, his, his offensive, my argument is that he lost you know, half his armoured warfare capability and his best troops from the beginning. And combined arms warfare requires skill, coordination and training, not available even if the equipment was available. And so the idea that he's going to rampage again through Ukrainian territory is just not, I think, feasible, especially with high Mars and long range you know, glide bombs are going to destroy every logistical route of that advance. And I, and I come on to that because the only place he really, I think, had options is in the Donbass. And that's why you're seeing this intensity in the Donbass increase. I think he's probably started, actually, his campaign about a week ago and just can't get it off the ground because the interdiction of any of the logistical routes for it to advance forward are being destroyed by HIMARS and, and glide bombs and other systems. So I think he is getting increasingly desperate. His Loss of life, obviously, is going through the roof, as we found out in the First World War. You know, when you when you attack fixed positions, you lose on very you know, double the ratio, three times of the defenders. I'm sure that's taking place right now. And the thing that people don't realise is that he has a negative demographic. So he's not Stalin, able to recruit a million men a, a month to go into the front lines and lose half of them and still stay ahead of the equation. He's in a demographically completely negative system that is super well at one stage the light will bulb will come on that their leader is killing the population in a giant meat grinder without purpose so he is running out of time in that respect so his only option left i think the nuclear option is always a risk and we can never underestimate someone who is desperate and believes the west to be weak but about three months four months ago about the time of the Nord Stream you know explosions which again is sort of Things ricocheting around it wasn't the Russians, it was the Americans. 
I think um, we have to really be careful about how we assess that and, and because it came in the context of um, two advances north and south by the Ukrainians, Putin's weakening position, and he was very close to hovering over the button. And um, the Americans finally cottoned on to how serious he was rather than just threatening and, you know, and playing. And they said, we will release a massive conventional strike if you do that. And the only response the Russians have to that is a nuclear strike. So in effect, the single use of a nuclear weapon in Ukraine was linked to a, an escalatory ladder of mutually assured destruction, which is how we got through the Cold War. And Putin's policy of escalate to de-escalate was always designed to be detached from that and use Western weakness in its leadership to not make the linkage. And therefore, he would get to keep what he'd taken from someone. So that was established. And so the nuclear ceiling was definitely raised. That's given the NATO nations greater confidence. And two months ago, I started to say it's really clear by the weapons provisions that NATO or elements of NATO have decided to finally give Ukraine what it takes to re eject the Russians from the borders of, of their country. And we are seeing that in every weapon provision, whether it's Britain you know, and partners, it's not just about. And we're seeing little things relieved about you know, in the press, you know, this idea that Moscow was killed by two Neptune missiles, which are modified by the Ukrainians, and someone let slip. Actually, it was the Danish Harpoon missiles that did it. So you can see all over Western involvement, we're up to our eyeballs in it. And I think that is appropriate. There is no way back. Once you go to this stage of conflict, you can only get yourself into a position of strength to negotiate. You can never negotiate from weakness. But we're weakening ourselves. Britain especially weakens Britain and NATO as a leading country that is the last country to recognize we need to really dramatically increase defense. Every other country around us is like made noises, tried to do something. Even France has tried to do it. But no, Sunak doesn't believe it's necessary. And the Treasury doesn't believe it's necessary. And I think he will end up just like Chamberlain did. The same fate awaits him. The greatest failure of a prime minister is to fail to defend the state. And he is absolutely reinforcing his failure with failure. I've been uh, reading a lot about the defence budget changes of all the, the, the long list of nations that included most of those that you've said there. Um, and what stands out about the UK is that under trust, they did commit to increase spending quite a bit, probably not as much as you suggest the 5%, uh, but I think it was up to 3%. And, and Sunex reversed that, if I understand correctly. Uh, and the Germans, it was a similar story. They, for a time, committed to a significant increase, again, not as much as you want, but then they reversed it again. So it seems that Europe perceives the Ukraine crisis to be winding down. Are we in for another surprise then in energy markets, especially over the course of 2023? Well, I, I think energy is going to go higher without doubt. We've seen the lows. They're pretty much established. And I think we're going to end up with surges. And that goes back to this idea about central banks thinking inflation's under control. And you know, they didn't even see it coming didn't understand really what it was. I love, you know, Andrew Bailey saying, we can't predict a war. And I wrote to him and said, well, I could. So wouldn't you like some advice? And there was silence. Um, and, and I find that really concerning when senior bodies say we couldn't and we can't and shouldn't be expected to rather than we didn't, but we're working on it. That, that's what we should be hearing because we all make mistakes. Not it's impossible to do that. And it's that same mindset. The problem with the central banks and the Bank of England is exactly, they've got these MMT programs that sit parallel to the central banks, stuffed full of gilts, funded with short-term interest rates that have got capital losses on their books because the, the gilts they got higher up. And they've got funding problems because they, they're literally like a bomb about to go off. So is it really no wonder that central banks are going to deny inflation, deny interest rate rises because the bomb goes off right underneath the building on their watch? Now, and they're the, the ones, they're that, the ones who light the fuse, ironically enough. Of well, they, their they lit the fuse high. and now they're sitting on the bomb and the fuse is running and they're just in denial that it is. So, you know, right now they should be thinking, so what form of war do you get next? that basically surges it again. And what sort of supply constriction takes place? Well, in the Kondratiev cycle, ironically, this is when you get resource supply constriction. You get the reorientation of supply lines as people pick sides. You get oceanic interdiction. And you just have a major problem because you suddenly need lots of copper for artillery shells. And there aren't, there isn't enough to go around. So that's where we are. And I think, you know, there was a project, Yellowhammer, in Britain, which was about, you know, the integrity of Brexit afterwards. And what we really should have is a yellow hammer on steroids, which was where do we get everything from? Where could we get it if we didn't get it from these locations? Make the assumption the world bifurcates because the Chinese are the next piece of this equation. And it's really not talked about 
And again, we should do. Because I do see a ground victory in Ukraine as almost inevitable. I don't see Putin on his own be able to stand back. But what my real concern is, the Chinese have a pact with the Russians. And that pact is based on a number of issues. Yes, common dictatorial values, right? common societal control mechanisms of hierarchy. But the Russians provided cheap energy, which basically was one of the tenets of the low maintenance of inflation through the past decades. And the Chinese provided cheap manufacturing to the Western world. Take those two away, match them together, and you've got this perfect economic model that Napoleon would love. It's a proper supercontinental model. As long as you can basically get your resources across the land border, and you can imagine right now the lot of infrastructure going in, because then you don't need the sea lanes. And it was the same thing Napoleon faced. Can't control the sea lanes, I'll just have a really big continental system. And as he found, it doesn't work because you resource yourself more from the rest of the world than any continental system. But that being said, the Chinese-Russian alliance has a huge, the greatest resource base, the greatest manufacturing base, and we should be terrified because we don't have a manufacturing base anymore. We gave it to the Chinese. So it's not an equal match. So that's an alliance structure. The next one is that, that China, as I argued earlier, has to make its move in the next couple of years or never at all. And so it's got a, it's a hypersonic window. It's got weakness in the Western world. And let's just look over. I'm Xi. I'm a hardcore politician who's elbowed my way through this massive system. I was brought up under Mao's displeasure with my family, lost its favour. I know what hardship is. And I look across and I look at Biden and I think, how weak is he? I look across at Olaf and think, well, he's owned by Putin. And the argument is that there was a rever I think there was a reverse takeover. East Germany overtook the political structures of West Germany. And in fact, we've had, we've had a cuckoo in the nest all the way through this. And so yeah, you can tick him off the list. Macron, almost as good in reverse as he's going forward, can't trust him. So you, you basically, you're never going to get a Richie, a Boy Scout, literally a child in command of a country with no geostrategic concept who is dedicated to the idea you can't have a strategic vision because you can't have vision you just like fiddle around the corners what perfect environment could a, a dictator wish for or a predator than a group of leaders who operate like that now the good news is i think there's a military cadre inside the white house which has obviously taken control of matters and become far more elbows out in there they were part of the solution to providing the right weapon systems into Ukraine. No doubt about it. And from the liberal construct of Europe, you're seeing people who are more realistic, like the defence minister in Germany, or there are elements with all these societies are beginning to stand up and push back against the same mindsets that begat World War I and World War II. Delusionary liberal hubrism, which failed to appreciate that predators think differently from a liberal mindset. And we're just happy to make money in between from them for a moment before they got their heads chopped off. So, so there is a movement within our society. It's, it's almost too late, but it's never too late. There are some good news that goes with the processes. That one of the things we saw in naval warfare was lateralization at sea, which was the basis of small populations like Holland and Britain becoming world superpowers. Lateralization gave disproportionate power with the right weapon systems to win against linearized land powers that took their ships to sea and couldn't deal with complex environments. The Spartans had the same problem with the Athenians. It goes back a long time. But on the battlefield of Ukraine, you're seeing individual mission command techniques used by Western armies where small groups with powerful weapon systems change the face of the battlefield. Now, if I was sitting in the, in the halls of the CCP, I would be having quite a head scratch thinking the system we've got of scale, you know, large hierarchy may not be as well adapted as we thought to deal with this point of, you know, small groups with powerful weapon systems. So there's hope. But... The trouble is we seem to be facing a problem where the first time we'll know the Chinese are our enemies will be a version of Pearl Harbor, in my opinion. It'll be a no warning. There'll be no political ramp up. And we will, as Americans will have been struck across every naval ship and base in the Asian Basin in 20 minutes because the DF-21s and 26s with the hypersonic glide weapons are designed to do just that. You either use them or you lose them. And that's the threat we face. And at that moment, we'll know that China has decided to support Russia. And we'll no longer just face Russians on the eastern border. We'll face Chinese and North Koreans. So it's the, we, we are walking into this conflict. And the energy stress that I talked about is just another stage on that pathway. And you never, ever, when systems get to this point, there is no place in history where de-escalation takes place.
He just only 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 if we if we shape a wand, rechange history and had reorientated our defence budgets in the West so they were far stronger and far more adaptive to the threats, then we wouldn't be in this situation. But we are. And the delay required means they have a window to operate and make their move. And they are going to do that, in my opinion. This idea of the tit for tat and the escalation ladder is one that I've been reading a lot about with Jim Rickards. Um, and his point is always that if you continue that then you do eventually get naturally to this nuclear level um, where things get especially bad. But right now, everyone's focusing on the next step, the next step, the next step, rather than seeing that bigger picture. So, I mean, I was going to ask you, you know, isn't it just Taiwan that China will take? And then you're explaining that it's going to be an all-out all out war attack. Um, there's not much that investors can do about what you're predicting, is there? Well, there's a couple of things. Let's go back and say... So the trouble is that so if you're a Chinese war planner and you know that you can't invade Taiwan in 48 hours because defensive weapons are such that you're not going to make it, as, as we found out in Ukraine. So a, a contested invasion is just not possible on a short notice strap. So the next thing you do is, you know, you need to blockade and you need to like soften up. Well, you'll need a couple of months to do that. And in the meantime, the Japanese have committed themselves to supporting Taiwan at whatever cost. And even if Biden is fumbling around in the White House, when the Japanese get engaged, the Americans have to join in because it's their main regional ally. So it's a cascade. That, so you're a Chinese planner thinking, well, I go to Taiwan, I will end up fighting everyone in the region. So far better to preemptively remove them from the chessboard, knowing inevitably they're going to come on their terms, than it is to actually just be delusional and think that way. So once you start to realize how that cascade works, and then if you go and look at the Americans did a blinding move of putting their bases into northern Philippines, because those bases with, you know, TLAMs, which are long range missiles, you know, cruise missiles now interlock with Taiwan, Okinawa, they control the South China Sea. So the, 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 I'm sure in the, in the PLAN, they literally went, damn, they're playing at their own game. So someone is thinking in the, in the White House, good news. But the trouble is it's interlocking means the only way is a preemptive strike, and it's a definitive one, and it comes without warning. So if the Chinese suddenly look really nice and sweet, then the next thing that concerns me is that in, uh, it's a really good, interesting little story. 28 days before Germany invaded Poland in 1939, the LZ-130 Graf Zeppelin like cruised itself up the North Sea looking for signs of British radar, and it was an electronic gathering system. And so... All they could pick up was a 50 hertz signal. And because their radar was sophisticated using high frequencies, they discounted the fact that Britain had a rather, rather sort of gronky 50 hertz radar system. And they thought it was a national grid. So they, from that point onwards, their reconnaissance process meant said no radar in Britain, which is why in the Battle of Britain, they never cottoned on to what the towers were, never understood why the fighter forces gathered every time a stream came over in, in, in British airspace. And I say that because the reconnaissance was a disaster for them because it actually put them back to front for the German Luftwaffe. But reconnaissance is always aggressive. It represents hostile intent. So what we've seen with the balloons is more hostile intent from China. Now, the octagons that have been shot down since, or in these multidimensional small shapes, they're not balloons, they're something else. But the balloons themselves, that is sort of, it's something that you do as you become more aggressive. You want more information. It's not something you do on a Sunday saying, hey, Joe, do you think we should just like whop that balloon over to America and see what they do? And I don't think the Americans responded very well either, supporting Xi's belief that, you know, that there's weakness at the top of the leadership to let it overfly the whole airspace and then shoot it down was an act of spite, I think, rather than actually popping it with a few sort of 20 millimeter shells out on F-22 that had the, the explosive taken out and watch it deflate slowly and actually collect its intelligence gathering system intact rather than many pieces. That was another, I think, sign of weakness rather than strength, but to the to, as a signal. So in answer to your question, those are the threads which lead us to this point where Putin is now desperate. Uh, his offensive is not going to work. He knows Western technology is coming, much as the Germans did in 1918, and they'd received 550,000 men from the Russian front. They went on to their spring offensive, hoping to create the terms of a negotiated peace with Britain by knocking the British Expeditionary Force out in the spring offensive and its four campaigns. Of course, we know what happened after that. They were exhausted. And then along came the BEF with this system of combined arms and tanks and artillery, which it couldn't use in defence because it was in attacking mode. 
and the Battle of Amiens, off they went. And my second book called Lions Led by Lions is about the victory and the construct around that. I got to think it's a very similar parallel to Ukraine. Right now, Russia is waiting for a hammer blow he can't stop. Western armor is something he cannot stop, used correctly. And so he knows he's running out of time. He's more desperate. So would he turn the energy taps off for months and reduce his revenue stream if he has nothing else left? Absolutely. So I think we'll see that, that continue more. I think we need to be concerned about his linkage with Iran and the Straits of Hormuz. That's a, that's a really concerning area. If, if they're already in a weapons sort of sharing dynamic of fighter planes for drones, then essentially what else are they going to get up to? Uh, and I'm concerned about the transmission of nuclear technology to Iran too, because you know the Russians have it and the Iranians don't. So will there be some secret transfer that facilitates the Straits of Hormuz to be shut, which then helps? So mm -hmm. these are scenarios that, if you're gaming them, they're real, and you can't predict a Hormuz Iranian process, but we can predict that Putin's going to find a way below the nuclear threshold to try and change, try and you know weaken Western sentiment. I wouldn't want to be a hedge fund manager in this environment either. <laughs> in fact, I think you've ruined my retirement plans you know, to go to Okinawa um, as well. Um, and I don't know if you realize, but I'm German, my wife's Japanese. So I think you've, you've offended everyone in the household at this point nicely. Um, but I want to ask what you would do if you were a hedge fund manager in this environment, given these predictions. I mean, other than defense stocks and perhaps certain no, governments, government no, bonds, well, you know, I don't know what else... Defence stocks have pretty well, you know, I think, maxed out their prices, strange enough. So I think they're vulnerable. It's a, that's the intuitive response. But I've looked at every defence stock and I wouldn't really want to own it up here. I think um, owning energy makes sense. Take that. Owning precious metals, probably my best survival suggestion uh, as mining stocks or whatever else. I think one of the clear uh, processes we're entering into, there is no way that bond prices can rise because this process is going to lead to in fee, increased defense spending across all of the Western systems. And so essentially, we're not talking about, let's just go to, when we went to war, and by the time the war started, we're talking about 55 to 65% of GDP spent by the UK fighting a war twice. That comes from only one place, debt. So you know, interest rates will rise because you know, of the process of the demand for money, and basically bonds are going to be issued on an epic scale again at a stage when they're already epically issued. <laughs> so it's not a good look. Um, and under that scenario, I can't see that generic stock markets have anything but a horrible whoopsie and downside. Um, and then when it comes to the currencies, navigating through you know, the decline of the dollar, uh, because I think we've seen a, a significant peak, hegemonic kind of moment, back last year, that we're, we're traveling on, on a lower dollar environment. And it's a question of which pairs you pick. So there are some pairs like, you know, love the Norwegian krona because it's basically a petro currency against in the things that are not. So the, the, there's plenty of really exciting opportunities once you accept this construct. And then the question always is where you enter and how you manage your risk. But actually, in these relatively low volatility times, and I think this is the thing that really keeps, so I keep thinking about, is using my algorithms for how wars start. It's difficult to imagine if you had half a brain and you were thinking individually that you didn't see the run-up to 1914 as being the run-up to war. And yet, collectively, in the same way we see denial right now, society constantly look for, it's not going to happen, it's only Archduke Ferdinand, don't worry about him, it's not this and it's not that, don't worry about the Agadir crisis before a couple of times and German adventurism, no, it's just, it's all going to be okay, but it isn't. And so the one thing for sure is that when war escalates to the next level, the markets will be truly surprised because they live like society in a state of collective denial. And what's also intriguing is if you look at the amount of knowledge about the military construct in the financial markets right now, it's very weak across our societies, but it's incredibly weak in, in the world of finance. And there are very few people who understand the world of the military domain and the financial domain in an overlap, because I obviously look to see if anyone else is around. And there's not. You get people who have financial views but they don't have any military understanding, so they don't understand that that works. So I think that overlap is absolutely a sweet spot right now. And, and all I can urge everyone to do is don't despair because that doesn't help anyone. Basically, get real about what it is, make more 
noise to your politicians and the people around you that we are obviously in threat. And the good news, and there is a story I really love, which is the, the, in the run-up to the Second World War, um, the air ministry subscribed to Trenchard's belief that bomber always got through. So it was a bit like nuclear war, you know, as in, I've got a big one, you've got a big one, we'll go off together, don't do it. Our bomber fleet's as big as yours. And that was the basis of the air ministry. And around 36, 37, the public decided they didn't like that idea and they demanded protection. And so fighter command came about. And it was always, you know, the unloved orphan because it went against bomber command's belief that the bomber got through. And of course, more than that, it actually showed that the bomber might not get through. So it was in opposition to this ministry structure. And... It was set up, and it was set up by a genius, and, and we know what happened, who you know, was also a technological, technology familiar with what was coming next. So he integrated this phenomenal organisation, a first of its kind, which saved us. But the origins of that was public opinion. It wasn't you know, some clever person in the government saying, we need this. On the contrary. So mobilisation of public opinion is really critical in this. And everyone has a voice. We live in a society. So, you know, when you read something about you know, Wallace is asking for a lot of money and it's 8 billion, 11 million, you should be jumping up and saying, if it was 10 times that much, it would just about be appropriate and, and get this order of magnitude involved. And as far as markets are concerned, don't expect to be getting a coupon from, you know, your investments as you have done through the, the period of money printing, preserving your capital, you know, making sure that you're in those right spaces of you know commodity dynamics, energy and, and precious metals actually could turn this into an immensely profitable time compared to other people. But traditional investing and those joyous people that think they should be in China because there's lots of opportunities, I think they should really be looking at their portfolios rather more carefully. David, thanks very much. I think to everyone at home, the best thing I can suggest that you do is go to davidmurrin.co.uk and have a look at what else David writes about because I think we want to hear some optimism and some opportunities after that. Um, I, I've, I've been stunned. I, I don't know what to say. I don't know where this is going, but um, I hope I hope you're more wrong than you have been over the last few weeks about the energy markets. Uh, and uh, thanks also very much to your cat for joining us as well. <laughs> yeah, the cat loves it. Loves a good show. Um, uh, look, I am actually, and people laugh about this. I'm innately optimistic, and I think we do have the ability to choose when we have knowledge the path ahead of us. That's the exciting part about democracy and education. But we haven't been exercising that very well, and we need to like step up to it. And uh, and and so my point is only once we do that and. You know, the, the journey from delusion to reality is painful when we suddenly take our rose-coloured glasses off. But once it's painful, humans adapt really well. We need to get those glasses off, adapt, and all is not lost, but it, we are at five minutes to midnight. So it's, you know, time to sort of put our skates on. Um, that would be my key optimistic message. Yeah, in many ways, good wake-up call is exactly what we need. Thanks for joining us, Endeavour at Home. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Nick.